My knees shook harder than the rattling helicopter blades as we descended toward the Giza plateau. I squeezed Sarah's hand, it was slick with sweat, just like mine. She glanced at me, her mouth in a tight line and eyes like a startled deer's. I don't think I looked much better. We weren't tourists getting an aerial view of an ancient wonder. This wasn't some Indiana Jones-style archaeological expedition. No, we were flying into the unknown, a gaping, impossible unknown. We were the impossible made real. Here's how it all started. A year ago, I was on my laptop at 3 a.m., knee-deep in the most boring data analysis a linguist has ever inflicted upon themselves. My specialty. Dead languages, the ones no one speaks anymore, the puzzles and mysteries of civilizations long gone. My girlfriend Sarah, well, let's just say she's about as far from a musty old archive as you can get. She's an astrophysicist, all telescopes and starlight. We joke it's a miracle we can even understand each other's dinner table conversations. That night changed everything. I was neck deep in deciphering a 5,000 year old inscription, something about offering to the star wanderers, when boom, the whole building shook. I thought it was an earthquake, California, you know, it's overdue for the big one. But when I got outside, the ground was steady, and the sky. Well, let's just say the sky wasn't how it was supposed to be. Picture this, a gigantic disc, bigger than any stadium, hanging in the air. It pulsed a soft blue, but what froze me to the bone were the lights underneath, rows and rows of them, shifting in patterns that were way too complex to be random. It was both terrifying and mesmerizing, like the universe itself had come for a visit and wasn't in any hurry to leave. Then came the blackout. It wasn't just local, whole eastern seaboard went dark. Military showed up faster than you can say classified. Roadblocks went up, helicopters swarmed. The next day, my inbox wasn't full of requests for translations from stuffy professors, but an email with a government seal so official it practically glowed in the dark. I was being summoned, expertise required, national emergency, blah, blah, blah. You get the idea. A black car and two very silent bodyguards later, I was whisked away to a makeshift base. Sarah, bless her heart, refused to be left behind. Despite her initial terror at armed men and secret locations, she insisted. Turns out, her kind of pattern spotting was exactly what they needed. And that's how the two most unlikely people on the planet landed in a think tank with generals, scientists buzzing around like crazed ants, and a whole lot of tech I'd never seen outside of movies. See, the thing about the ship, the object, as they called it, was those lights. They weren't just pretty. They were a language. Not a language like Spanish or hieroglyphics, but a mathematical one, based on sequences, frequencies, patterns. Things Sarah ate for breakfast. Only, this breakfast was more complex than any equation humankind had ever come up with. Weeks turned into months. Sarah ran simulations till she could barely stand. I dredged up every ancient encoding system imaginable, desperately trying to find a connection. The military guys got more jittery by the day. The public was still clueless, cover stories are a heck of a thing, but the brass knew this wasn't some friendly alien hello. The air crackled with unspoken questions, why are they here? What do they want? And the big one? Are we about to become an exhibit in some galactic museum? Then, it happened. Breakthrough isn't a strong enough word. The object's lights, they weren't just a language, they were coordinates. Earth coordinates. More specifically, the pyramids of Giza. Talk about your oh crap moments. The military shifted from tense to full-blown DEFCON whatever the highest level is. Within 48 hours, Sarah and I weren't just hunched over computers. We were on that rattling helicopter, armed escort in tow, buzzing toward the most famous monuments on the planet, only now the focus wasn't on the wonders above the ground, but the ones the aliens clearly thought were hidden below it. The pyramids loomed ahead, bathed in the golden afternoon sun, looking both majestic and menacing. They'd always exuded an air of mystery, whispering of pharaohs and ancient gods. Today, that whisper turned into a scream, we weren't about to decipher musty scrolls. History was happening right now, with us at the heart of it. The helicopter landed not at some tourist-filled plaza, but a makeshift compound crawling with soldiers and scientists. Tents sprouted like desert flowers after rain, the entire area cordoned off in a way that screamed top secret. The air crackled not with the heat, but anticipation. Were we the welcoming committee? or about to witness a war that spanned the stars? We were hustled inside a tent buzzing with computers, holographic displays, and a whole lot of nervous energy. A wiry woman in a lab coat thrust satellite images into my hands. Sarah was bombarded with charts of electromagnetic readings. There. The woman barked, pointing to a blurry shape under the Great Pyramid. 
anomalies, void spaces, energy signatures we can't identify. Something's down there, and the object, dash she couldn't even bring herself to say spaceship, it led us straight to it. I gaped at the images. My whole life, I'd studied the remnants of what civilizations left behind. This. This was a civilization leaving something for us to find, a message not written on crumbling papyrus, but built into the bedrock beneath one of humanity's oldest structures. They've been here before, Sarah breathed, her eyes glued to the readings. The energy signatures. They're old, ancient even, but something's reactivated them recently. A chill ran down my spine. We weren't the first explorers venturing into this hidden space. We were walking a path aliens had laid out millennia ago. Were they watching even now, their giant ship hanging silently in the sky? The military commander, a grizzled man with eyes like storm clouds, interrupted my spiraling thoughts. Enough theories. We're going in. You two, he nodded at Sarah and me, are our point team. Whatever you do, whatever you find, the second you do, you report. The words barely registered. Going in? Me? I decipher dusty tablets, not navigate alien labyrinths. But as I looked around the room, at the mix of fear and desperate hope on those faces, I realized they weren't asking a linguist or an astrophysicist. They were asking humanity's representatives, proof that even amidst the terror, there was curiosity, the drive to understand. Sarah squeezed my hand, her own was still shaking, but there was a fierce determination in her eyes. A year ago, we bickered over who was getting the last scoop of ice cream. Now we were humanity's guinea pigs, about to find out firsthand if the universe held friends, enemies, or something far stranger. A makeshift elevator rattled us down a newly excavated shaft, sunlight giving way to harsh floodlights. The air grew thick and stale, the weight of history pressing down heavier than the rock above. Each jolt vibrated through the cramped car, our breath catching in unison with every clang. Two soldiers flanked us, armed to the teeth and nervous as cornered cats. They were good guys, no doubt, the kind who'd run into a burning building for a stranger. Out there, facing terrestrial threats, they'd be heroes. Here, they were as lost as we were. Sarah whispered calculations like prayers. Numbers had always been her comfort against the vastness of the universe, a map when there were no stars to guide her. I was less equipped. I knew dead languages, not fear, but it slithered through me anyway, cold and relentless. I studied the soldiers' faces, trying to find a flicker of certainty, some clue to what lay ahead. There was none. Finally, the elevator jolted to a stop. Not at a sleek, futuristic alien lair, but a rough-hewn tunnel. Its walls were carved from solid limestone, claustrophobically narrow. Our flashlights cut through the gloom, revealing tool marks that could have been made weeks or millennia ago. The soldier ahead of us gestured toward a gap low in the wall, barely more than a crawl space. Sarah went first, her movement surprisingly agile given the circumstances. Watching her disappear into the blackness, I felt a surge of the ridiculous urge to check if she had her library card or grab her jacket in case it got chilly down here. Then it was my turn, and all rational thought vanished. I squirmed through, the coarse rock scraping my skin, the very air feeling like it was resisting my intrusion. The tunnel twisted like a serpent, forcing us to duck, contort, and crawl. I heard a muttered curse from one of the soldiers as his helmet scraped the ceiling. Progress was agonizingly slow, the weight of the unknown pressing down harder than tons of rock. Yet, there was something else I sensed, a strange prickling on my skin, almost like anticipation. Then the tunnel finally opened into a chamber. It was vast and empty, the floor smoothed as if by an unseen hand, the walls rising into shadow. There were no obvious markings, no alien tech glowing in the gloom, just a sense of space that should not exist beneath the desert sands. In the center, a square shaft plunged deeper into the earth, its edges so sharp it seemed machine cut. Readings went haywire, Sarah whispered, her flashlight aimed at equipment I barely understood. Something's interfering with everything. One of the soldiers held out a comm unit. Dead static. He swore under his breath, then motioned with his chin toward the shaft. We crept closer, our footsteps echoing in the chilling, empty space. Below was not darkness, but a faint luminescence, an eerie green glow pulsating from the depths. It wasn't natural, not a bioluminescent cave thing, but something. Manufactured. Rigor line, the gruff voice of the commander crackled over the useless comm, the staticky tone highlighting our isolation. A soldier started uncoiling rope, attaching a harness meant for mountain climbing, not descending into an alien abyss. He looked at me pointedly. I glanced at Sarah. Her lips were a thin line, but the fear in her eyes was mirrored in my own. We'd come this far, 
not by choice, but there was no turning back. I nodded, swallowing hard against a rising tide of nausea. The harness was agonizingly tight, the rough rope grating against my palms as they lowered me. The green light grew stronger, bathing the smooth rock walls in its sickly radiance. My stomach lurched with vertigo, even with the rope, the descent felt more like a fall into the unknown than a controlled exploration. After what felt like an eternity, the glow resolved. My boots crunched on something that wasn't limestone, something grittier, faintly crystalline. I swung my flashlight around, my heart pounding a frantic rhythm in my ears. It wasn't some grand alien hall, no gleaming machinery or indecipherable control panels. It was a tomb. A single sarcophagus lay in the center, carved from the same luminous green stone as the light below. But what chilled me to the bone were the markings. It wasn't some alien script, but hieroglyphs, the familiar symbols of ancient Egypt etched into its surface. Suddenly, I wasn't just staring at alien technology. I was staring at a horrifyingly real link between them and us, a twist in human history so grand, so impossible, it threatened to unravel my entire understanding of the past. My voice croaked a single word, up. The rope pulled, hauling me back towards the chamber above, my ascent painfully slow. When I scrambled over the edge, Sarah was already there, shoving her instruments frantically at the commander. It's not recent, she said, her voice tight. The energy. It's old, older than anything we've ever dated. But something's activated it, something the object did. The commander's weathered face paled even further. So they've been here before. Long before. He ran a hand over his close cropped hair. Damn it, folks. We need answers. Whatever those hieroglyphs say he looked squarely at me. The weight of their stairs pushed down. I, the dusty translator, was suddenly the linchpin. I moved toward the sarcophagus, my legs feeling like lead. The hieroglyphs, usually the key to a forgotten story, were now a source of cosmic dread. They spoke of a pharaoh, yes, but not with the usual reverence. They whispered of star travelers, of offerings, and bargains. Terrible, world-altering bargains. My fingers traced familiar shapes, but the meaning had shifted, warped into something dark. This wasn't a record of the past, it was a warning. But was it left by the aliens, or our own ancestors? And what exactly had humanity agreed to in exchange for? What? Knowledge? Power? Survival? I could feel Sarah close by, a silent support. I needed her, the scientist who understood patterns on a universal scale. If I was going to decipher this nightmare, it wouldn't be alone. Hours blurred. We sketched, we argued, we referenced my battered notebooks filled with every translation of every scrap of hieroglyphic ever found. The words swirled and danced before my eyes, the weight of them threatening to crush me. Finally, a picture started to form, fragmented and horrific. It wasn't a tale of peaceful first contact, but something more akin to a desperate bargain. The pharaoh, faced with some unknown catastrophe, had turned to the star wanderers, offering them sanctuary within his kingdom, and they, in return they'd offered a twisted salvation. The sarcophagus, it wasn't a tomb, but a stasis chamber, a place where the pharaoh would sleep not the sleep of death, but a sleep beyond time. He was waiting for them to return, for the agreed-upon moment when he would awaken and usher in whatever apocalyptic plan was put in place so long ago. I stumbled back, the enormity of what I'd deciphered making the chamber spin. Sarah grabbed my arm, her usually cool touch grounding me in the moment. We have to tell them, I managed, my voice a hoarse whisper. The commander listened, then cursed so viciously it would have scorched a lesser man. So, they used us, he growled. Played some ancient king, left a ticking time bomb under our feet. He paced the chamber, a caged animal. We need to get the hell out of here, shut this thing down. One of the soldiers shifted nervously. Shut it down? Sir, we don't even know what it is, or how. The commander barked a humorless laugh, let's not get bogged down in the details, soldier. But Sarah held up a hand, the shaking finally stilled. Wait. Maybe shutting it down isn't the answer. This whole thing. It was set in motion long ago. Maybe interfering would be worse, might trigger something. An argument raged. The military types wanted action, containment, control. Sarah, and surprisingly myself, sided with caution. This wasn't a leaking pipe you could seal with duct tape, it was a cosmic chess match where even touching the board might have catastrophic consequences. We returned to the surface under the cloak of night, the stars above now mockingly familiar after the alien horrors below. The sight buzzed with a desperate, focused energy. Teams scrambled, equipment was packed up, orders flew back and forth. 
In the chaotic blur, there was a chilling sense of finality. They're going to destroy it, Sarah murmured, not with surprise, but a tired resignation. Bury the problem, pretend it never existed. The idea of destroying such a monumental discovery, twisted as it was, gnawed at me. To erase this message, no matter how dangerous. It felt wrong. But what was the alternative? We were locked in a makeshift command center, Sarah surrounded by reams of data, me hunched over hieroglyph fragments like some kind of doomsday crossword puzzle. Every hour brought grim reports from the remaining team below, military-grade explosives were being placed, strategic and brutal. Then, it happened. Not an explosion, not a cataclysmic alien retaliation, but a change. The object, which had hung in the sky silent and ominous, began to shift. The blue glow flickered, sections winking out like dying stars. Then, with a groan that reverberated through the air despite its distance, the entire structure tilted. It was subtle, only a few degrees, yet the effect was immediate. Sarah leapt to her feet, knocking over a chair. The coordinates, she cried, shoving graphs at me. It's aligning with something else. Frantically, I cross-referenced the new coordinates against star charts. The results were a punch to the gut, it was realigning toward another location. Not in Egypt, not even on Earth, but a distant, unassuming star system we barely had on the map. They're leaving, I breathed. All this time. It wasn't an invasion, it was a retrieval. Chaos erupted. The commander, mid-argument about detonation protocols, froze. Suddenly, our underground nightmare was superseded by an even greater terror, the aliens were on the move. And whatever awaited them at their new destination. We couldn't stop them from going there. The countdown stopped. Orders were cancelled, then reversed. The focus wasn't destruction anymore, but study. Sarah's equipment became priority, any data collected before the object departed was now more valuable than gold. We worked through the night, fueled by adrenaline and dread. Sarah zeroed in on specific energy frequencies, searching for some pattern, a clue to their new destination. I dug deeper into the hieroglyphs, no longer just deciphering them, but looking for hints of the pharaoh's original intent. Had he been tricked or was this? Cooperation? Hours stretched into a blur of coffee and half-finished theorems. Then, with the first rays of dawn, Sarah gasped, I've got something. On the screen, a pattern emerged, frequencies mirroring a star within their departure trajectory. Not a bright beacon, but a dying sun, barely noticeable. Yet something about it was, familiar. The sarcophagus, I whispered, a terrible revelation dawning. It's the same energy signature, magnified a thousandfold. Suddenly, the pieces fell into place, forming a picture so horrifying it bordered on the absurd. The pharaoh wasn't just some ancient ruler buried in an alien tomb. His stasis chamber was no mere resting place, but a prototype. The sarcophagus was a beacon, a homing signal, the final piece needed to awaken whatever slumbered on that distant world. We weren't just facing a hidden threat, we were complicit in it. This wasn't about saving Earth, it was about potentially damning an entire unsuspecting star system. We burst into the command center, demanding an audience. The commander, exhausted and bewildered, listened as we poured out our crazy theory. His scowl deepened with every word. So you're saying this pharaoh guy is a freaking Trojan horse? That we not only destroyed an alien welcome party for nothing but managed to light up a pick-me-up sign directed at whatever hellhole is next on their itinerary? He let out a bitter laugh. We can't let them get there, Sarah insisted. Whatever's on that planet, they have no idea what's coming. There was a silence so long I thought the commander's head might explode right then and there. Slowly he stood, a flicker of reckless resolve replacing the grim resignation in his eyes. All right, eggheads, he addressed us, let's say for the sake of argument your insane theory is right. How the hell do we stop a spaceship that can tilt itself at will, huh? We don't even have a slingshot big enough. Sarah, ever resourceful, gestured at the screens filled with readouts of the object's weakening energy field. Their power is dwindling. They may be able to travel, but their communication, their long-distance senses... They're compromised. You think we could blind them, I realized, a desperate flicker of hope igniting. If we could overload the pyramid site, jam their frequency, they might pass by that system completely unaware. It was the longest of long shots. We were betting on technology the likes of which we barely understood, using a monument built by an ancient civilization as an interstellar scrambler. Yet, with the alternative literally hanging over our heads, it was the most action we could take. The operation was as frantic as it was absurd. Power was diverted from half the country toward Giza, 
the military machine roaring in a strange, desperate harmony with teams of scientists. Sarah recalibrated frequencies like an orchestral conductor, aiming the electromagnetic chaos skyward. I, meanwhile, became an unlikely military advisor, my knowledge of the pyramid's internal structure, burial chambers, and long-forgotten passages suddenly the only map they had in navigating this potential catastrophe. As the sun rose higher, a countdown began, not for destruction, but for a disruption. The object pulsed in the sky, a wounded beast struggling against a force it couldn't comprehend. Then, with agonizing slowness, it began to shift course. Not back to Earth, but away, its trajectory no longer intersecting with the doomed star system. When the object finally blinked out of existence, swallowed by the vastness of space, a cheer didn't rise, but a ragged sigh of relief. We slumped in our chairs, a victorious army too exhausted for celebration. We had averted a crisis, yes, but not through our brilliance. Rather, through sheer, desperate luck and the echoes of a deal made millennia before we even walked the earth. We didn't have time to contemplate what-ifs. The aftermath was its own kind of nightmare. Cover stories were hastily concocted, freak weather phenomenon, top-secret military exercise, the usual mix of truth and lies designed to keep the world blissfully ignorant. Sarah and I were debriefed, poked, prodded, then signed more non-disclosure agreements than I care to admit. The days turned into weeks of restless limbo. Sarah was shipped off to some observatory, given powerful telescopes as a consolation prize, told to look for signs of their departure. I was sent back to my dusty archives, surrounded by the whispers of dead civilizations that suddenly seemed a lot less dead. At first, we clung to the hope that it was over. The aliens had retrieved what they came for and vanished back into the cosmic depths. Maybe it was a one-time deal, a strange isolated event that would fade into the history books as an unsolvable riddle. Then the nightmares came. Not jump scares or visions of conquering armadas, but something worse. Sarah couldn't sleep without seeing patterns in the stars, nonsensical strings of numbers that made her scream herself awake. For me, the dreams were ancient, sand, blood, and a monstrous bargain etched not on stone, but on my very soul. I jolt upright, gasping for air, convinced the sarcophagus pulsed beneath my own skin. We'd compare notes on secure lines, hushed voices filled with rising panic. It wasn't just bad dreams, it was. A sinking. Like a part of us had been tethered to them, the mental equivalent of a tracker you couldn't remove. One rainy afternoon, a package arrived at my doorstep. No return address, just the government seal mocking me with its official stamp. Inside was a single photo and a typewritten message. It has left our solar system. Destination unknown. Monitoring continues. The photo was of a star field. Ordinary at first glance, but Sarah would know, she'd pour over it. There would be an anomaly, a subtle alignment, a frequency hidden in the cosmic noise. They were out there, heading somewhere new. And we were their unwitting compass. Sarah called a few hours later. They're accelerating, she choked out, they're not just drifting, they know where they're going. The rain lashed at my window, mirroring the icy dread flooding through me. The safety of ignorance was gone. The universe wasn't just vast anymore, it had a terrifying direction. And somehow, we were at the center of it, humanity's unwilling ambassadors to an unknown doom. The government would call again, of course. They'd offer more labs, more resources, and the unspoken plea for a solution we didn't have. We'd go back, fueled by a desperate mix of duty and a horror that consumed us more with every passing day. But out there, hurtling between the stars, the countdown had begun. No soldier could stop it, no equation predict the outcome. We'd meddled with forces far beyond our own, had lit a fuse we couldn't extinguish. And somewhere out there in the endless dark, something waited, unaware of the terrible gift we'd unwittingly sent hurtling its way.